If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to go ahead and open, first of all, to the book of Colossians chapter 1. There will be a couple other texts we'll look at as well, but that's the one we're going to start with. As some of you may know, I may have mentioned this before, or you may have picked up on it if you ever tell me thank you, but over the course of the four years that I lived in Louisville and went to seminary, I worked at Chick-fil-A. And when it came time to move to Louisville and to find a job while I was at seminary, I chose to work at Chick-fil-A because of my experience I had there as a guest. And if you've ever been there, you, you probably know. And by the way, if you haven't been there and you don't know what I'm talking about, we should definitely book a field trip so you can understand what I'm talking about. But my experience as a guest was that the, the experience I had at Chick-fil-A was an experience that was simply unmatched and unrivaled in the fast food world. The food was consistent, it was hot, it was great, the speed of service was excellent, and the hospitality and the service was, like I said, unmatched. And I would leave happier. I would literally go and I'd be like, I'm just happier after leaving Chick-fil-A because of how excellent everything about it was. And so when it came time for me to find a job, I thought, I want to go work for an organization that operates at such excellence. Not only that, but I want to know, how, how do they do it? Like, how do they operate with such excellence in everything that they do? And so I went there, and I started training, and it didn't take me long to figure out what it was that made Chick-fil-A so excellent. And I could probably think of other things, but there are three things that I could pinpoint that allowed them to do what they do with such greatness. First, they know who they are or what they are. They're a fast food restaurant. They serve chicken, waffle fries, and they try to do it with speed and efficiency and with service and hospitality. That's who they are, and they know it. The second thing, they know what their mission is. Their mission is to glorify God by being faithful stewards of all that is entrusted to us and to have a, a positive influence on all who come into contact with Chick-fil-A. They know who they are. They know what their mission is. Third thing, they do a great job of teaching who they are and what their mission is. And then they secure buy-in from their employees. So in training, it's made known right from the start. This is who we are. This is what our mission is, and this is how we live this out in practice. And if you want to be a part of our team and, and be an employer, you will do this. You will buy in. You will smile. You will say my pleasure. You will make eye contact with our guests. And the result is that you get a drive through that can put through 215 cars in an hour with service and with hospitality that's simply unmatched. They know who they are, they know what their mission is, and their people have bought into it. And as a result, they fulfill their mission with excellence. Can the local church say the same thing about itself? Because the reality is that if we are to operate at our optimal efficiency and our optimal excellency, if we are to fulfill all that God has given us to fulfill, then we have to know who we are. We have to know what our mission is. And then ultimately, we have to buy in. And that's what we aim to do in this sermon series here in the month of June. We want to teach on who we are. What is the church? What are we even doing here? We want to teach them what our mission is. What's actually the, the point? Why has God put us here? What are we supposed to do? And then lastly, we want to secure buy-in. And our hope is that in so doing, we will grow to new and improved health, to new and improved excellency in our mission. And so this morning my, is the first sermon in this series. I'm going to focus on what the church is. And like I said, and like it says in the bulletin, I'm not going to preach through one text or one passage, but I'm going to have three main points. And each point will come from a different text of Scripture. And each of those texts will make a different point about what the church is. And then they'll build on, the, on each other so that I hope by the end we'll have a greater idea of what the church is. We will know who we are. 
So before we begin, let's pray for the Lord's help in this. Father, you have called us out of darkness and into your light to be your people, your treasured possession. Would you help your people this morning pour out your spirit upon us, open our hearts, our minds to receive your word? Would you apply it to our lives? God, show us who we are. Show us who you intended your church to be. And we pray that you would move us to buy in this morning. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. My three points this morning are this. Point one, the establishment of the kingdom of God. That comes from the book of Colossians. Point two, the citizens of the kingdom of God. That comes from Philippians chapter three. And then point three, the administration of the kingdom of God. That comes from Matthew chapter 16. And so our first point, look at Colossians chapter one, verses 13 and 14, the establishment of the kingdom of God. Starting in verse 13, it says this. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So before the Lord opened our eyes and our hearts and he saved us, we were under the authority, under the power of darkness. We weren't good moral people. We weren't just a a neutral, like morally neutral, blank slate that could go either way. We were under the kingdom of darkness. In fact, we were happy slaves in the kingdom of darkness. Jesus says as much in John 3.19. He says, the light has come into the world. And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Brothers and sisters, that was us. We were under the power, the authority of darkness, and we loved it because our works were evil. You think of your life before you knew Christ, that was you. Under the power of darkness and loving it. And that is the reality in which our entire world lives. The rest of our world is still under the power of darkness. Darkness. That is the reality for all who have not turned to Jesus in faith. As verse 13, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. That is the good news of the gospel. That God has delivered or removed us from this kingdom of darkness and then he transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. We were were perfectly content living in a state of rebellion against the true king. But even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He has lived, he has died, he has risen again and ascended the right hand of the Father to bring about the forgiveness of our sins, to redeem us from the powers of darkness. He has reached down and plucked us out of the kingdom of darkness and placed us into the kingdom of his son. That is what happens when a person becomes a Christian. There is something supernatural, something spiritual, something powerful that happens in the unseen world. We are transferred into the kingdom of God. Now, to help us think about this, let's use our imaginations a little bit. So think through this illustration with me. Just imagine with me that there is a kingdom. And the kingdom is ruled by a good, a righteous, kind, benevolent, and just king. A good kingdom ruled by a good king. But one day, an evil king comes. And he tries to seduce all of the king's subjects to rebel against their good king and to follow him. And follow him they do. Because every single one of this good king's subjects is seduced. Every one of this good king's subjects follows this evil king. And this evil king then enslaves them and he takes them back across the sea to his own kingdom. A kingdom filled with darkness and wickedness, injustice. And this is where all the people live. And so years go by, but one day the good king sails across the ocean and he comes and he lives in the kingdom of darkness as one of its own people. 
And as he lives in that kingdom, as he lives among the people, among the rebels who were his former subjects, he begins to preach the coming of a new kingdom, a kingdom in which he is king, a kingdom filled with righteousness and peace and justice. He comes and he proclaims that he is the true king and that all who will come and submit to his rule and his reign will be ushered into his kingdom. They will become citizens of his kingdom. That is what Jesus has done for us. We have all rebelled against his kingship. We have all enlisted in the armies of darkness. We have submitted ourselves to the shackles of slavery of the powers of darkness. And yet Jesus has come from across the sea and lived as one of us to redeem us, to forgive us of our sins, to usher us into his kingdom. God has established his kingdom by bringing about our forgiveness and our redemption through Jesus. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. That's our first point. But there are expectations for citizens of the kingdom of God. If you just turn back a a page or two to Philippians chapter 3. There are expectations for citizens of the kingdom of God. And the expectation is that citizens of the kingdom of God would live as such, that they would actually live their lives in a way that reflects their loyalty to the king of kings. So look at Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 17. It says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Now, we are called to live as citizens of the kingdom of God because God has made us so. He has made us citizens of his kingdom. But this is not as easy as it sounds because we still live among citizens of the earth. We still live among the kingdom of darkness, even though we have been called out of it. And you see that in verses 17 through 19 there. That is the world in which we live. Most of our world walks as enemies of the cross of Christ, repudiating, rejecting, calling the message of the cross foolishness. Their God is their stomach. The citizens of the kingdom of darkness, they are slaves to their own physical desires, fulfilling whatever their physical desires call them to do. They glory in their shame, celebrating, boasting in, even taking pride in things that are shameful and wicked and rebellious. Their minds are set on earthly things. And ultimately, as he says there, their end is destruction. That is the world in which we live. That is what it looks like to live in the kingdom of darkness. And we, even though we have been called out of that kingdom into the kingdom of God, we still physically live among the kingdom of darkness. Look at verse 20. Notice the contrast that he, he makes with verses 17 through 19. The contrast he makes between us and the citizens of the kingdom of darkness. Verse 20, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The world lives like this. The citizens of the kingdom of darkness live like this. Their God is their stomach. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. But we are citizens of heaven. We have been transferred out of that kingdom and into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. 
Therefore, we ought not to live like them. We ought not to live as citizens of the kingdom of darkness. For our citizenship is in heaven. As a quick aside here, we are still citizens of the United States of America. And that's a good thing. We ought to love our country and work for its good. And so now it's like we hold a dual citizenship in two nations at once. We are citizens of the United States, and we are also citizens of the kingdom of God. That is a good, true, beautiful thing. But our highest allegiance, our greatest loyalty, our purest devotion must be reserved for our heavenly kingdom because only our heavenly kingdom is eternal. From it, we await a Savior who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. The United States of America is a wonderful gift by the grace of God, but it won't last forever. In eternity future, all nations of the world will be footnotes in the history books, but we will go on living in the kingdom of our God. This means that if you are a Christian, if you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you have more in common with a fellow citizen of the kingdom of heaven than with a non-Christian citizen of our own nation. You have more in common with a fellow Christian in Indonesia or Ireland or Iraq than you do with a non-believing citizen of the United States because our truest, purest citizenship lies in heaven. And so one day, we will worship around the throne of our king, along with our brothers and sisters who have also been redeemed from every tribe, nation, tongue, and people. And therefore, look at verse 4, one. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, this is his command, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. In other words, therefore, Live as citizens of the kingdom of God. We have been delivered from the powers of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of God. We are citizens of it. We therefore must not live as the rest of the world does. We must not be slaves to our physical desires. We must not boast, and that is what's shameful. But we must stand firm in the Lord, keeping our eyes and our mind fixed on Christ above at the right hand of God, for that is ultimately where our life is. Let's return to our illustration of that kingdom. So let's just imagine our king. He comes to this land far away of darkness. He preaches his kingdom. The kingdom is coming. All who submit to my kingship will be made citizens in my kingdom. And then he leaves. He sails back across the sea to his own land. And he leaves his citizens there where they lived. He says, one day I'll come back for you and I'll take you to my kingdom. But now you are staying here in the midst of this kingdom of darkness. But he doesn't just leave them there to just kind of sit there, twiddle their thumbs and just, just kind of wait for him to come back. No, he says, you stay here in the midst of this kingdom, but as you remain here, I want you to start living as citizens of my future kingdom now. And so the driving force in the lives of his subjects ought to be the reality that one day their king will come back and establish his kingdom for eternity. That is what will drive them in their lives. That, will, that is what motivates them. That is what determines their behavior. And that ought to be the driving force in all of our lives. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we await a savior, a king, the true king who will come. He will transform our lowly, broken, sick, tired bodies to be like his own glorious resurrection body. And we will live with him forever in his glorious resurrection kingdom. And so let us live in the midst of this world, like that's our greatest hope. Let us live 
as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. God has established his kingdom by calling people out of darkness and into his kingdom, point one. He expects his citizens to live as citizens of his kingdom. Then our third and final point, the administration of the kingdom of God. If you turn to Matthew 16. The main point I'll make for Matthew 16 is this. We are not meant to live as citizens of the kingdom of God on our own. We are not to just go about ourselves walking, you know, kind of flying solo. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God, and I just, here I am in the world, in the midst of the kingdom of darkness, by myself, trying to live out my life as a citizen of heaven. Rather, we are to live as citizens of the kingdom of God in officially sanctioned groups of fellow citizens. And those officially sanctioned groups of fellow citizens are what we call churches. Look at Matthew 16 here. We'll start in verse 15. It says Jesus with his disciples, so he, he gives them this question. Verse 15, but what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Right, so Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds by saying, blessed are you. On you, Peter, so upon you and upon this confession you made, I will build my church. And so to confess this, to confess that message, Jesus is the Son of the living God. He is the Christ, the Messiah, to whom I give my life, my loyalty, my fealty. That is the point of entry into the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, I will build my church upon this confession. And that's what he does. Look at verse 19. He goes on saying to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What Jesus says in that verse, Matthew 16, 19, is that the church, the local church, is an outpost of the kingdom of heaven. That, in other, that is to say that the, the church, the, a local church on earth, is a, a legitimate manifestation or extension of the kingdom of God in heaven. And we know that because Jesus says, I will give you, you, Peter, the the foundation, the rock of the church, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. What are keys? It's a sign of authority. You ever give the keys of your car to someone? You pass them on. Here, you have the keys to my car. You have the authority to drive the car. This is yours, and now it's an extension of my authority. That's what Jesus does here. He, he hands the keys of his kingdom over to the church and says, you have the power to exercise my authority now. And the authority to do what? He says, to bind on earth what will be bound in heaven and to loose on earth what will be loosed in heaven. Now, what does that mean? It means that the church has been given the authority by Jesus, by the king, to make judgments or pronouncements upon his behalf. And those judgments will carry the very authority of the king himself. And so what is the church to judge? What is the church making pronouncements upon? What are they binding? What are they loosing? Confessions. Confessions of faith like Peter's. 
The church is built upon Peter's right confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so then the church is is entrusted with that message. The church preaches and proclaims that message. Jesus is Christ. He is the King. Bow to him. Submit to him. The church proclaims that message to the world. And as that message is proclaimed, people will inevitably hear that message and say, I believe that. And the church has been entrusted by Jesus to make judgments concerning the rightness or the wrongness of the confessions of individuals. In other words, the church has been entrusted with the responsibility by Jesus to recognize who is and who is not a legitimate citizen of the kingdom of God. God, because the church is an outpost of the kingdom of God. The church has been entrusted with the keys of the kingdom. And so I'm sure we'll get here in coming weeks, but this is what church membership is. This is why we practice church membership. This is why we have steps to go through for people to become members, not just because we're sort of stuffy and uptight, but because we have been entrusted with the responsibility by the king himself to determine who is and who is not a legitimate citizen of his kingdom. And by taking a person into membership in the local church, we are saying, this is a kingdom citizen here. This person is. And when a person submits to church membership, that person is saying, yes, I am a citizen of the kingdom of God, and I want to live out my citizenship with all of you fellow citizens. And so that is what the local church is. It's an an outpost, a little tiny manifestation of the, the kingdom of God in heaven. And in that local church is... Little citizens of the kingdom commit to living out their citizenship together. This means that Christ, our king, he is administering his authority, his rule and his reign over his kingdom through local churches such as this one. Now let's carry on our illustration a little bit further. So this king comes, he preaches his kingdom, he saves people from the kingdom of darkness, makes them citizens of his kingdom, he commands them, live as citizens of my kingdom, I'm going back across the sea and I will come back for you. But before he goes away, he tells them, I want you to gather. I want you to gather with fellow citizens of my kingdom. I want you to commit to them, and I want them to commit to you. And I want you all to watch over each other as citizens of my kingdom, to make sure that you are still living faithfully as citizens of my kingdom when I return. So that all over this kingdom, there are these little gatherings of, of kingdom citizens who are meeting together every week, living out their citizenship in the kingdom of God together. That is what local churches are. The church has been given the keys of the kingdom. It has been sanctioned by Christ himself as an official outpost of his kingdom. And he has commanded his people not to neglect the meeting together, but to encourage one another all the more as the day of his return draws near. Christ has established his kingdom by transferring people out of the kingdom of darkness and into his own kingdom. He has called us to live as citizens of kingdom, and he has called us to do that in fellowship with one another in officially sanctioned groups called churches. That is who we are. That is what the church is. An officially sanctioned group of citizens of the kingdom of of heaven, affirming one another's faith, encouraging one another, committing to one another, helping one another live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven until our king returns to finally and forever establish his kingdom. That is who we are. Now, in closing here, let's talk about a few implications of, of that truth and some applications. First, the church, the local church, is for 
Christians. The local church is not primarily, it's not primarily an evangelistic event for non-Christians. It has that effect. That is part of our mission, yes. But it is primarily a gathering of the redeemed people of God to worship God together as one body. It's not an optional add-on for the Christian, not an optional social club in which the Christian may or may not choose to participate. It is where citizens of the kingdom of God gather together so that they may together with one voice exalt our king and encourage one another as citizens of his kingdom. So the church is for Christians. And as we gather, as we've done here this morning, as we'll do after this, as we'll do next week and Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday until the Lord comes and calls us home, we will gather and we will exalt and declare the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We come and we hear the word of our king preached and he rules his church through his, his word. We come and we, we sing, we declare his praises, we address one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We see his word lived out through baptism in the Lord's Supper. The church is for Christians. It is where we gather to encourage, to edify, to sanctify, to help one another. We, we come together, we confess our sins to one another that we might be healed. We love one another, we bear one another's burdens. Together, as one body, we gather and we fix our eyes, our gaze on heaven so that by his spirit we are all conformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. The church is for Christians. The church is also for non-Christians, and we'll talk about this more next week. But the church is to be a light to the nations, an outpost of the kingdom of God, the place where the world can look and see that's a, that's a gathering of people from a different kingdom. That's different. They don't live like us. There is something otherworldly, something supernatural about that gathering of people right there. And in that way, the local church is to be a light to the nations. It is the place where they ought to come in and say, the Lord is here. Surely these are the people of God. Surely this is the word of the living God. I, and in that, they are convicted of their sin, and then they too are called out of the kingdom of darkness. They are brought into the kingdom of his Son, and we welcome them into our fold. The church is to be a light to the nations, a city set on a hill, a beam of light shining forth from another world. But only secondarily, because it has to be what it is to God and what it is to Christians first. That is who we are. That is what the church is. That's just a little snippet of what our mission is. We'll talk about that more next week. Will we, will we buy in? The church is an outpost of the kingdom of God. We have been made citizens of his kingdom. And so the question facing us is this. Will I participate in the life of the kingdom into which I have been called? Will I commit to my fellow citizens of the kingdom of God? And will I have them commit to me? Because when it comes down to it, you can't commit to a king without committing also to his kingdom. That is what we do here at the church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word by which you have redeemed us from the powers of darkness and brought us into your own kingdom. And Father, we just pray that you would help us now to live as citizens of your kingdom, to commit to one another, to love one another, all the more as we see the day of your return drawing near.
We pray that you would do this for our good and for our joy and for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.